All right. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the e-discovery overview session. Uh, my name is Georgiana Bada, and um, I work for Microsoft Consulting Services. And today we're going to talk about um, the new features and capabilities of eDiscovery in SharePoint Server 2013. Um, so as you've no doubt heard and seen for yourself by now, uh, SharePoint Server 2013 represents massive leaps forward in many areas of the platform. Um, and one of these areas is eDiscovery. Um, so this session is meant to serve as an introduction and overview of SharePoint 2013 new eDiscovery capabilities. Um, so if we are to go back a little bit uh, in time, um, we had some basic eDiscovery related features in SharePoint Server 2007, uh, more specifically the ability to place uh, records on hold. But really, a more cohesive e-discovery story didn't start to happen until the release of SharePoint Server 2010. Um, with SharePoint 2010, we got a, a top-tier search engine that helped us discover content. And we also got um, the ability to place and manage site-level holds. Um, we got the ability to copy e-discovery search results to a different repository for review. Um, and we also got um, an API that allowed us to develop custom solutions against these features. Um, however, that being said, there were some uh, basic limitations to the capabilities of SharePoint 2010. Um, for example, the features mostly applied to SharePoint content. And um, if a hold was placed on a site, it effectively uh, prevented users from working with that content. So that was especially problematic when conducting internal investigations because uh, it would alert those being investigated to the fact that they were under scrutiny. Um, so concluding this brief history, let's see what improvements were made in SharePoint Server 2013 when it comes to eDiscovery. So first of all, um, what is eDiscovery? It's basically the process of gathering and producing electronic content um, to be used as evidence in legal cases, such as um, litigations, audits, or investigations. And e-discovery is expensive and challenging. Um, the average uh, corporate civil uh, case may cost over a million dollars just in e-discovery expenses. And you can get in big trouble and receive fines if you don't follow the proper e-discovery process. So there is a lot of stake here. Um, so the Electronic Discovery Reference Model, or EDRM, gives you an idea of what eDiscovery is. Um, and I've broken that down into four of the most important steps that uh, you see on the slide here. Um, the first one is identify and preserve. Um, and it's all about, this is all about identifying the people and sources of content that you care about for e-discovery. Um, it's content that's going to, going to be involved in the case. You want to protect, and you want to make sure it doesn't get deleted because it will be used as legal evidence. Search and process is all about reducing the relevant content that needs to be reviewed. You want to reduce your data to the smallest amount possible because review is expensive. Um, once you have reduced the data to the relevant content set, you export that and hand it off for legal review. So then we're getting into the third phase, which is the legal review. And this is when you have attorneys go through and read page by page all of the content that you'll send off to court. And attorneys are not very cheap. In fact, they're quite expensive. So having them read through pages and pages of documents, and we can be talking gigabytes of data here, uh, that's going to cost a lot of money. So it's easy to see where you can really help your organization reduce cost. Finally, the last step is produce. And this is where we take the content that has been reviewed and we produce that into a format that's acceptable by the court. So in the beginning of the process, we have a large volume of content, often hundreds of gigabytes of data is what we hear uh, from our customers. But then you reduce that content and you work towards increasing the relevance. 
So in the review stage, hopefully if you have a good uh, process, you end up having those lawyers review a couple of gigabytes or a few gigabytes of data, and by the time you go to court, they're actually presenting tens or maybe a couple of hundred of pages uh, of documents as legal uh, evidence. All right, so e-discovery is hard and the legal risk is scary. Your data is growing and growing each year, your content is building up, so there is an increasing cost to, uh, over the years, to go through and analyze and review the data if you are involved into a legal case. Um, so when we're talking to our customers, there were three major challenges that came up again and again. The first one was around preservation. Um, we heard from our customers that when a legal event begins, there's immediately a legal obligation to make sure that any related content is not modified or destroyed. So we need to protect that content. And as we know, content is spread across many different locations, including email systems, file shares, SharePoint sites, as well as user computers. Um, and SharePoint can be especially challenging because we're dealing with a variety of data. It's not only documents, but uh, social data, web pages, or list items as well. And unfortunately, there's not really a great um, acceptable standard or easy way to get the content out of SharePoint and into an offline format uh, that you can just send off to your lawyers to go through and review. So that is a big concern that we've heard from our customers. The second one was around search and data reduction. With an average cost of $10,000 per gigabyte for legal uh, review, the biggest e-discovery cost saving that companies can realize um, is basically by reducing the data set that they send off for legal review. So it often takes weeks or months of manually collecting content and then using expensive e-discovery tools in order to search and do data reduction. And the same applies to the preservation step as well. Um, so has anyone ever had their legal team come to them and ask for uh, content? How do we get this content out of SharePoint or Exchange or, or user's computer and export that to a separate repository because we need to review that? <laughs> so, did, did you enjoy getting those requests? <laughs> All right. So, as a SharePoint community, we're going to get to deal with these requests more and more often. And when we talk to the exchange people, they're actually, they have been dealing with this request even longer because email represents about 80% of the content um, for electronic discovery. So, the exchange admins uh, get this request all the time and they have to deal uh, wisdom day by day. The third challenge is around export. Um, getting the content out of SharePoint and Exchange is just hard. It often requires a lot of uh, manual effort by IT as well as your legal team to be able to get that content out. And also you might be concerned uh, about moving to the cloud. Uh, another concern that we've heard was around uh, the legal teams who say, well, if we move to the cloud, how are we going to be able to get that data out and, um, and preserve it for e-discovery? So that is another major concern we've been hearing. All right, so with this, um, let's just switch to a quick demo. And see how the new interface looks like. So when I first log in, what I get is the eDiscovery Center template. That's a, this is a new SharePoint template. Um, and this is where I go to manage any existing cases as well as create new cases. So this is a default homepage where we have uh, some instructions on how to take advantage of, of the template. Um, so the eDiscovery Center is basically a new type of site collection that uh, SharePoint server 2013 introduces, and it serves as a portal for managing uh, e-discovery cases. So what, what you're going to do when you uh, receive a new request for e-discovery is come here and create a new e-discovery case. 
And what that does is um, it basically creates a collaboration site that you can use to organize information related to, to your e-discovery request. So think of a case as a container. It includes uh, all the queries, the content, uh, the, and the preservations that are associated with a specific litigation. And from within an e-discovery case, you can search for content, you can apply hold to content, you can export content, and you can view the status of different holds um, and exports that are associated with, with a case. So I have a number of cases here that I've already created. Uh, let's open the one called Northwind Traders for a quick investigation. So, so here's where we can address all the challenges that I've described earlier by accessing specific e-discovery functions from, from the case, um, from the e-discovery case homepage. Um, so we can discover content uh, in the SharePoint farm, in Exchange Server 2013, on file shares, and in other SharePoint farms. We can apply holds to uh, SharePoint and Exchange content that we discover. And when we identify the specific items that we want to deliver, then we can export that to an industry standard format. And we're going to talk about each one of the steps in more detail. Um, so when we look at an e-discovery set, we basically have two major components. We have e-discovery um, sets, and we have queries. So we use an e-discovery set to find content and apply a hold. And we use a query to find content and export it. Um, in this case, I have an e -discovery, I have two e-discovery sets, one named content and one named hold. Um, so let's look at the one called content here. And in here, I have a number of um, different result sources that I've included in this set. Um, so you'll see that I have um, three mailboxes. I have one document library and one discussion list. And here they are. So I have this three users mailboxes. I have a document library and a discussion list. And the nice thing is that I, I easily um, can review the stats about this, uh, about this content. I get the number of items here and the total size. Um, I have a filter that's applied to my content right now, and that is uh, the keyword North Wind. But I have no date or author filters or domain filters, but these are also options for you. Um, in this case, I haven't placed the results on hold yet. Uh, this is the section that allows us to place uh, content on hold. And the nice thing is that I can easily preview the results on the same page from both SharePoint and Exchange. So let's take a quick look at the query now. Um, so the query screen in the query screen, um, we, have, we have the same uh, filters that we can add as well as KQL, keyword query language, that we can build in here. In my case, I have just the, a single uh, keyword, which is Northwind. Um, and again, on the query screen, I'm able to preview results from both Exchange and SharePoint. And I can also filter by the type of document or by the type of exchange object on the same page. So these are all refiners that allow you to, uh, to narrow your search down. Um, and I'm just going to show you one more thing here. If I click on Modify Query Scope, I actually get the number of options here. I can search across multiple e-discovery sets, or I can limit myself to specific sources. In this case, I, uh, I've limited myself to one mailbox and um, two lists. I'm going to cancel this. All right. Um, so e-discovery is complicated, but to make it easier and solve the challenges that I've, uh, I've mentioned before, We've just made it as easy as one, two, three. 
So in place hold helps you protect the content in real time. Query helps you analyze and make decisions to reduce to the most relevant content you care about. And export allows you to transfer with a few clicks to get the data out of the system so you can use it in another e-discovery tool or send it off for legal review. And of course, this works across uh, SharePoint, Exchange, Link, and file shares. Um, and whether you're on premises or in the cloud, we have the tools you need to, uh, to, to solve all e-discovery challenges. So let's talk a little bit more in detail about the in-place hold and how it actually works. So with SharePoint 2013, we get this concept of in-place hold. In-place holds can be placed either at a site level, a mailbox level, or they can be the result of, um, of a query-based preservation. So with query-based preservation, you basically define uh, e-discovery search queries, and only content that matches your query will be preserved. So the interesting thing is when you apply uh, an in-place hold to a site, your, the content in the site remains in its original location. Users can still work with the content, but a copy of the content as it was at the time that the hold was placed uh, is being preserved. So in-place holds differ from the style of hold that you could use in SharePoint Server 2010. In, in SharePoint 2010, users could not change or delete content when it was on hold. By using in-place holds in SharePoint 2013, users do not even have to know that the content is on hold. So an in-place hold is applied at the level of a site. So when a hold is placed on a, on a SharePoint site, a preservation hold library is created. And this is exactly its name, preservation hold library. Um, and most users cannot view the preservation hold library. It is visible only to site collection administrators. And there's also another special case, which is um, users who are granted permissions at the web application level and who are able to view all content in all site collections within a specific web application, so those users will also have access to the preservation hold library. So how does this work? So, if a user attempts to modify or delete content in a site that has a hold, then SharePoint will first check whether the content has been modified for, for the first time since the hold was applied. So if this is the first modification since the hold was applied, then SharePoint will copy the content to the preservation hold library and then will allow the user to continue with, uh, with their modification or deletion of the, con of the original content. Um, so any content in the site can be copied to the preservation hole library, even if the content doesn't match the filter of the e-discovery set that initiated the hole. And that is because we have a timer job, which is the information management retention timer job that cleans up the preservation hole library. So this timer job will run periodically and we'll compare the content in the preservation hold library with the filters for the e-discovery set that put the site on hold. And unless the content matches at least one of the filters, then the timer job will delete the content from the preservation hold library. So there are two important consequences of this, of this whole process. So one is the version of the document that is current at the time that the hold was applied is the only version that is preserved. So if the content is changed multiple times, or if it's placed on multiple holds, intermediate versions of the content are not preserved, right? So when a hold is placed on a site and a user edits a document that is being preserved, um, the original version of the document in its state as the time the hold was applied gets copied into the preservation hold library. However, if subsequent edits are made to the same document, um, those additional states of the document are not captured. And this type of uh, continuous rolling holds are necessary for some customers, so that's why it's important for them to understand this, um, this limitation. Um, if an item is placed on hold multiple times, SharePoint preserves the version that is current at the time that the hold was placed. 
So say, for instance, uh, version 27 of the item is the most recent one when the site is placed on hold for the first time, and version 51 is most recent when the, the site is placed on hold for the second time, then only versions 27 and 51 will exist in the preservation hold library. The second big consequence of this is that storage space is used efficiently. So because most content in a site does not change, um, content that is not changed is not copied to the preservation hall library. Um, another thing I want to mention is, as you know, there's no way out of the box to actually search past versions of SharePoint content. Um, and this makes sense because it would be very confusing to see past versions of documents showing up in your, in your normal search results. But it would be incredibly useful for some customers for e-discovery purposes. So in order to solve this, you can develop a custom search connector. And here, SharePoint provides a, a rich framework for building custom connectors. Or you can leverage the new features of um, uh, export that we have in SharePoint 2013, which allow you to export documents with all the previous versions uh, to a separate location where you can actually review the versions as well if you need to. Um, and I also want to talk a little bit about the integration with Exchange 2013. So to search Exchange content, SharePoint actually uses uh, Exchange's federated search API. So regardless of whether you search Exchange content from the uh, Exchange Administration Center, this is the, the Exchange 2013 brand new unified web-based administration tool. So regardless of uh, whether you search content from there or you go to a SharePoint Discovery Center, you get the same search result. And the reason is that the new SharePoint and Exchange both use the same underlying indexing and querying engine, which is Microsoft Search Foundation. Um, so that basically allows you to use the same query for both SharePoint and Exchange and get the same results. So assuming that we uh, manage our e-discovery process from, um, for Exchange Server 2013 from a SharePoint e-discovery center, we have a number of capabilities. We can add Exchange mailboxes as sources to either e-discovery sets or queries. We can preview content that is discovered in an Exchange mailbox. We can apply a hold to uh, an Exchange mailbox. And we can also export content from an Exchange mailbox to a PST file. So there are a few steps that you'll have to take care of before, uh, before you're able to do that. Um, you need to configure a trust relationship between your SharePoint farm and your Exchange 2013. Um, you also have to grant specific exchange permissions to the users of eDiscovery Center. Um, so to use in-place eDiscovery, a user must be delegated the eDiscovery management role group. Um, so you're probably going to find it easier to address this by creating a, an Active Directory security group for eDiscovery users and, and manage it that way. Um, also, Exchange must be added as a result source to the search service application that is associated with the eDiscovery site. So, um, so all this are detailed in a great TechNet article, step-by-step, uh, step in terms of how, um, how to configure this relationship. Um, another thing that I want to mention is, just to be very clear, the in-place holds are only for SharePoint 2013 and Exchange 2013 content. So um, what if you're not on this platform, then can you use SharePoint 2013 eDiscovery uh, with content that resides, for instance, in SharePoint 2010? Well, the answer is yes. Out of the box, you can do everything related to eDiscovery except placeholds on that content. So you can search 2010 content from 2013. You can filter it down. You can export it with all the versions, and you can generate reports. You just can't place holds. Um, so to be able to manage discovery of Exchange content through SharePoint Server 2013, you must be using Exchange Server 2013. And to manage discovery of link content through SharePoint, you must be using both 
uh, Link Server 2013 and Exchange Server 2013. All right. Um, so when we talk about preservation, uh, we we have to talk about the concept of immutability. So immutability means that messages or documents that are placed on hold must be preserved without alteration. So we should not only prevent users from deleting them, but we should also be able to prevent the content from being uh, tampered with or altered. Um, now, in-place hold is a feature that allows us to preserve content from intentional tampering or, or modification. And this is achieved by performing a, what is called a copy on write, which basically means that when a user or a process attempts to modify the content, uh, before the modified uh, content is saved, a copy of the original content is made and saved to a different area. In the case of Exchange, this is an area called recoverable items where there's a versions folder, uh, and that's where the preserved content goes to. And in the case of SharePoint 2013 is the preservation whole library that we just, we just discussed. Okay, so with this, let's just go over a quick demo for the in-place hold. All right, so I'm going to go to an e-discovery set that I previously created, which I call North, Northwind uh, Hold. And in here, I have a mailbox and a document library uh, that I've already placed, in hold, placed on hold. So if you notice down here, enable in-place hold is on, and the hold status is on hold with filter. My filter, again, is the keyword Northwind. So what I want to do now is, uh, let's see what my experience is as a user if I say access this document library and I attempt to modify um, a document. So I'm going to go here in my, I have a shortcut here to my document library. And here I have a number of documents. Um, and I'm just going to pick, um, I'm just going to pick, say, project plan and delete it. And then I'm going to pick project report. And I'm just going to edit it in Word Web App really quickly. All right, so now, because I have site collection admin privileges, I'm able to see the preservation whole library that I just mentioned. So if I go to site content, I have my preservation whole library in here. And what I have is a number of items that were modified and that were, as I mentioned, saved um, in the form that they exist at the time that the whole was applied. So here's my project plan and my project report. So one of them is the deleted uh, document. One of them is the edited, modified document. So their, their original uh, copies were, were saved in here before the user action was performed. So as you notice, everything is transparent to the user. They do not know that these items are on hold, that they're being uh, copied behind the scenes to, to this preservation area. Um, the other thing I want to show you here is, um, okay, if I, as a site, uh, as a site collection admin, attempt to delete an item from this document library, from this preservation, I actually get an error, and I'm not able to do that. The only way to delete items from this uh, library is by removing the in-place hold, and um, otherwise, there's there's no way for me to to uh, alter the content in, in any way. Uh, 
All right. So let's talk a little bit about query. So uh, when we want to when we want to uh, find and export content, we'll be using queries. And each query contains the uh, contains query filters and sources to be to be searched. So uh, query filters basically define what we're searching for, and they resemble a filter in an e-discovery set. And they can all include search terms. They can include date range and an author's name. Um, when we talk about sources to be searched, um, we're talking about exchange mailboxes, SharePoint sites, file shares, and e-discovery sets. So this can all be sources in a query. So when we run a query, we're going to get statistics about the number of items that were found. We, uh, we're going to get the ability to preview the results, just so we can sample our data and make sure the query is working. And we can also filter the results by object type for, for exchange object or uh, file type for SharePoint results. And when we're finished, we can actually export the query. So um, with this, let's just see how, how the query works. I'm just going to go back here. So, um, so just to go over the steps uh, um, again a little bit um, further. So, after you create a case, you'll be the first thing you do is you create an e-discovery set, and in here you you uh, cast your net wide and you include all the content sources that may be relevant to your case, right? And you can use filters in here as well, such as keywords and start date, end date, domain, or author. But once you have identified the potential sources, you use queries to help further refine the content that you want to export for review. Um, so this is how we're increasing the relevance. And we can construct our filter by using, again, keywords, date ranges, author domains, proximity searches. Uh, we can also um, take advantage of special operators, such as Boolean and proximity operators, if we want to create relationships between, uh, between multiple keywords. Um, so if we need to use multiple operators, we'll just group them with uh, parentheses to determine the order in which, in which they are applied. So if you're familiar with KQL, then uh, this is going to be very easy. So in my query right now, I have uh, a single keyword that I'm going to change to a more uh, complex query. And I'm going to type in here, um, I'm going to use the operator near. And I'm going to say present. So one thing to keep in mind is that all operators must be written in uppercase letters. Okay, so I've changed my query, I click on search, and that's going to give me the, um, the new result set. So what this query is saying is basically um, give me all the documents or all the content where the words meeting or present wildcard, so presenter or presentation, are within five words distance of the word north wind. So the near function finds uh, words that are near each other, and n uh, equals the number of, of words apart. Um, and oh, you're all familiar with wildcards, so they can help us expand the keywords to include terms that contain part of a keyword or terms that have alternative spelling. Um, so the, the one area I want to point out here is the query statistics. So I know that I have six results, and if I expand this, I can actually see how I can actually see how parts of the query contributed to my result set. So I can get really detailed uh, query statistics breakdown. So this is very uh, very helpful. 
Um, and here I can browse the results, as I showed you before, in the same screen from both Exchange and SharePoint, and I can actually preview uh, the documents that, that were found. Okay, so I'm just going to save because I want to keep this um, uh, query. So keep in mind that you can create as many queries as you want or need for, for your needs. And I'm just going to go back to the slides. All right, so now let's talk about the next step, which is export. Um, so we have made it very easy to download and get an offline copy of the content from SharePoint, Exchange, Link, or file shares. Um, in SharePoint 2013, you can export the results of an e-discovery search for a later report into a, a review tool, or you can export all of the content that is associated with an e-discovery case. And what do we mean by all this content? Well, first of all, documents. We can export documents from file shares, and we can export documents and their associated versions from SharePoint Server 2013. Uh, if we have lists, then um, in, if list items are included in our e-discovery search results, then the complete list is exported as a CSV file. If we have SharePoint pages, such as wiki pages or blogs, they can be exported as MIME HTML um, .mht file, files. And if we have um, exchange objects, basically, any item in an Exchange Server 2013 mailbox, such as tasks, calendar entries, contacts, email messages, attachments, they are all exported as a PST file. And if, we, uh, if you archive link conversations uh, to Exchange, then link conversations can also be discovered and, and exported as well. Um, in addition to that, what you're going to see in the export package is uh, a number of reports detailing uh, if there are any errors with any of this content from Exchange or SharePoint, as well as an XML manifest. Um, and this, this XML manifest complies with the electronic discovery reference model specification, or EDRM, and it basically provides an overview of the information that was exported. So for those of you not familiar with this uh, EDRM project. The goal of the EDRM XML project is to provide a standard, generally accepted XML schema uh, to facilitate the movement of electronic information from one phase of eDiscovery to the next, from one organization to the next, and from one uh, software platform to the next. So when we talk about electronically stored information, we we mean two things. Um, not only the underlying discovery materials, like the actual content itself, but also information about those, uh, those materials, such as metadata, the source of the underlying um, uh, electronic information, processing and production of that information. So, so all that is captured in this XML files, a file that you get with the export package. So this industry standard, this EDRM, XML industry standard is currently supported by approximately 40 vendors. Um, and basically, companies will be able to take our export package from SharePoint 2013 and load it into a different tool. Um, and we've also been working with a number of major players uh, in the e-discovery space, such as AppPoint, Lighthouse, Kcura, Access Data, and FTA Consulting, uh, through our um, technical events preview program. Okay, so with this, let's just see how export looks like. So uh, I'm going to go back to the query that I have just modified four minutes ago. And I'm going to export my results here. So at the bottom, I have a button that says export. And when I click on it, I am actually presented with a number of options. So 
I can choose to remove duplicate exchange content. So say you know you have an email that makes uh, that uh, is part of your e-discovery set that was sent to five people. So five mailboxes will have the same content. So you may want to remove that because it's uh, it's duplicate content. So you can do that by simply checking this box. You can include versions, what I was mentioning before, for SharePoint documents. You can include items that are encrypted or have an unrecognized format. Um, and this is the query that uh, uh, supports our, uh, our export. So I'm not going to select anything. I'm just going to click on OK. And in here, I have a number of options. I can click on Download Report, and what that's going to do is it's going to tell me how many um, successes or failures I would have if I attempted this export. So um, it's a good way to see if there are any problems with any of the, of the documents or messages that, that you're trying to export. But um, I'm just going to go right ahead and download the results. And what that, this is doing is it's launching the eDiscovery Download Manager. Um, and I'm going to be prompted to authenticate to Exchange. I'm going to say here. Test one. So you choose a location where you want to save your export package. You will have to authenticate to Exchange. Com. And um, so the, the eDiscovery Download Manager is an application that you use to export the results of a search. Uh, to produce to authorities or import into a review tool. And this uh, download manager will export all of the content that is associated with the case, including documents, lists, pages, exchange objects. Um, so once it's done, we can actually go and look at the export package. So I'm going to close it, and I have saved my export package in here. All right, so in here we have three folders. We have documents, exchange, and reports. So under documents, what I have from my library is a PowerPoint presentation document and an HTML document. So this is the format that they were uh, exported to. And then um, if I go under exchange, I have the Garth Forth mailbox, which was uh, part of my um, of my uh, e-discovery query results. Um, so this is uh, exported as a PST file. And in reports, in here, I get all the export errors compiled into one report, or I can look at individual exchange or SharePoint errors and, um, and see how I can address them. So in this case, we won't have any. Um, so we would know when the download manager finalizes the export because it will let us know right then and there if it completed with errors or not. So then we, we know that we have to check this reports out. Um, and in here, we have the XML file that I was mentioning. Um, let's see if I can make this. All right, and this is the XML data that gets exported. If you notice, I have all the metadata associated with each file that gets exported out, and um, a number of other information, such as location, um, source of the, uh, of the content. All right. So. Um, Going back to my export screen here, I'm just going to go back to my case. And I'm just going to show you one more thing. So, um, so by now, all the demos that we went through were basically we discovered content, we queried it, we reduced it, we exported it out. So we're now ready to close our case. So when we do that, when we uh, close the case, and I'm just going to click on case closure here, it's going to inform me that uh, all the in-place holds will be released for all the sources. So closing a case will automatically remove the in-place hold on your content. So I'm just going to say cancel. All 
right, go back to the slides. All right, so there are a few things that I want you to take away from this session. So first of all, you learn about the capabilities of eDiscovery across Office. So in place hold lets you preserve content in real time to, uh, to protect important data for legal actions. Uh, query helps you identify relevant content. And then export gets the relevant data out of the system so you can hand it off for legal review. Um, and then we have the three advantages that I've talked about. In place, which helps you reduce your risk, makes things faster. You got um, higher fidelity preservation of the content because you, you're just handling it natively in SharePoint and Exchange. And we're helping you use less storage space. Uh, you're not ha having to create a separate archive and copy all the content out and go back and copy new content over time. So we're helping you save money there. Uh, the second advantage, real time, that means faster searching, get answers immediately. The content is up to date. So when you're doing your searches, you're able to get uh, up to date data because we're just leveraging the built in search system of, of Exchange and SharePoint. And content is always up to date. And then finally, more content. So um, we can preserve, search, and export OneNote files, web pages, um, link IMs, link meetings, and much more. We just, we just handle all that content for you. Um, so these capabilities and advantages and the interface that we've built, um, we help make e-discovery a lot simpler and a lot easier, which helps you save time and money and reduce risk so you can protect your organization. So with SharePoint 2013, uh, Exchange 2013, and Link 2013, you have all the tools you need to quickly respond to legal requests. So you can protect your organization without getting in the way of of your users. All right, so in terms of related content, there's actually a really good um, hands-on lab that I would recommend, um, which is basically using archiving and eDiscovery Center in Microsoft Exchange Server 2013 and working with eDiscovery in Microsoft uh, SharePoint Server 2013. So if you're doing, if you get the chance to do this uh, these two labs, this would be a great, uh, a great ex hands-on experience for you. Um, and uh, there are also uh, a few related breakout sessions around, um, around search that uh, you might find of interest. All right, and we have our typical resources that we, we uh, refer you to. Uh, on TechNet, you're going to find a lot of great stuff about the configuration steps for uh, specifically around what I mentioned before, configuring that relationship between, um, between SharePoint and Exchange. Uh, and on MSDN, if you're interested in developing custom solutions using the um, eDiscovery API, then that would be the place to find more information. All right, and finally, complete an evaluation so you get an opportunity to win a cool prize. And I guess that's it. So we're now um, just in the Q&A phase. Sure. Um. Yeah, the exports and the imports, is there, I, you might have already covered this, but I missed it. Is there a maximum size on those? Like how big a file can it create for you to download? No. Um, so you'd be, I guess, limited by your upload maximum um, file size that you, you configure for your SharePoint. But uh, the export would work with whatever you configured. Okay. So, so it's, there's, there's no technical limit on how big of a... No file that it creates. And then on the import side, so we're looking at evaluating Office 365, so we've got a bunch of data that's in another archive. If I have PSTs to bring into that system, is that again just based on the SharePoint upload limit like you just mentioned? So if you're bringing PSTs in, then you'd be limited by the exchange maximum size, right? Okay. Um, so that right. would be 
based on your exchange configuration of how much you allow your your mailbox size to be, okay. and that will be yeah. All right, we're going Lotus Notes, so we're going to be doing Lotus Notes conversion to, to exchange, and then so I don't know what the and then, maximums are there, but that gives me gives me enough to work okay. with. Thank you. No problem. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. Um, on your legal hold of the data in, in place hold, and then you go and close a case, you said that it releases the hold on all the data that's associated with that case. Correct. But what happens if the data is on hold for multiple cases? Oh, if it's on, okay, if it's on hold for multiple, uh, as per multiple holds, then obviously it will still stay on hold. So closing the case will not will not remove the hold on, it will remove the hold that is associated with your case. But the case, not every case. But not the other holds. So, so your preservation hold library will still exist and your versions will be kept in there for the other holds. Absolutely. For the other cases. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure of that, that's all. Of course. What? So then you'll have multiple versions. Exactly, exactly. So as I, I think I just in just my in my examples, if you have you know version 27 and version 51, and then you have um, you know uh, your preservation hold library, you will will have both these versions. And then when you remove a hold, then your version associated with that hold will be gone, but the other one will stay. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Anyone else? Yes? Um, not that I know off the top of my head, uh, but I'm sure, I mean, if, uh, if this will be, you know, be a, a requirement, it will quickly be a space that will be filled out by, by one, of our, one of our partners. Um, but um, as it stands right now, I don't know of any third-party tool that, that would, uh, would address that. Well, you have the ability to, um, uh, so, so when you say time-based, just so I'm sure I understand, you mean Right. I see. So you want to automatically have the hole removed after a period of time. Um, so I don't. I don't know of any way you can do that out of the box um, right now. So it would have to be sort of a custom job or some sort of timer job that that checks that. Unfortunately. <laughs> That's a great question. So um, unfortunately, that's not something that we, we have a solution for. Um, I know that there are third-party tools out there. Um, I've actually heard of one, and uh, I, I just, uh, I'm just drawing a blank right now. But, um, but there are special tools for that. But unfortunately, it's not something that is included in our, in our platform at the moment. 